Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So with this presentation, indeed, I'll show you this investigation that is ongoing together with my colleagues from Lausanne and Gifu University, co-authors. So I'll first introduce you our experimental analysis, ongoing experimental analysis for the characterization of the fatigue strength of these thick transfer attachments, uh, and then the design for the variable amplitude fatigue tests. Uh, here you see a picture of, of, the, of the setup in which this transverse attachment is, is indeed uh, connected by a uh, clamp that is bolted connections and is loaded in uniaxial tension. Uh, the shape of the specimen is, is a bit unusual because this was a specimen that has been used by uh, one of the co-authors for multi-axial uh, multi uh, fatigue test. So we, we don't apply any force on the top connection and we just leave uniaxial loading, global uniaxial loading. Uh, the, the instrumentation consists in uh, measurement of, uh, through DIC of the strain field on two locations on the west side of this, uh, of this uh, so two out of the four locations. And uh, uh, we aim to have um, indication of crack growing on the surface. And we are actually first now uh, doing this with DIC, uh, but later on we will try also with ACPD. So to do that, we, we basically uh, introduce some virtual extensometers uh, uh, of uh, five millimeter length, of one millimeter length, uh, along the well toe where the crack will occur. You can see here uh, one example of, uh, of a failed specimen uh, where we see uh, that we have one uh, uh, leading crack that has nucleated more or less in the center of the specimen but uh, also coalescence with uh, many, many small cracks. Uh, evidence of this is given by the presence of these multiple ratchet marks that actually were also on the other side. I don't know if it's really visible, but they are very small also on the other side. Uh, and uh, through the DIC that unfortunately uh, <laughs> up to now is always installed in the opposite location where we have the crack, but through the DIC, although despite this, we are able to see that something is happening on the other side. Of course, just in the last, very last uh, moments of the fatigue life where probably the crack is already large, but we will use anyway this information to compute some crack aspect ratio uh, or depth from, okay, it's not really sensitive. You, can, you could notice that most of the curve, but for the first one is really evident. There is a, a, a change in the slope of this reading of this virtual extensometer which, which is synchronized with the machine when the load is maximum and uh, that is eventually due to coalescence so the, there is a change because crack has grown uh, bigger suddenly uh, we up to now have uh, limited uh, test results but this uh, experimental program is ongoing and uh, here we compare it with the uh, with the characteristic curve uh, of the Eurocode, which is a characteristic uh, fatigue resistance at 2 million cycle of about of 80 megapascal. And also on the, on the right hand side, you can see actually a comparison of this uh, characteristic curve with test data from the literature. There is a huge scatter. This huge scatter might be due to uh, different uh, size of the attachments, different weld leg length, different load ratios, misalignment of the two attachments. There are many factors that can play a role. Uh, but overall, we see that with the thickness, with the true increasing the thickness of the of the plate of the of the attachment, of course, we get a closer, uh, a lower bound result. Uh, about the design of constant amplitude fatigue tests, uh, our goal was to um, to apply to our test specimens is to apply to our test specimens a, a loading test, the loading history that more or less ensembles loading histories for bridges as we work in this field. Um, most of the tests that have been carried out in the past, I don't know if you're familiar with those, but uh, uh, basically start from the assumption that the spectrum has a shape of a Rayleigh distribution. And from this assumption, many authors in the past have carried out fatigue tests by either, for example, randomly sampling a, blot a block of loading and repeatedly applying it up to specimen failure from this Rayleigh distribution or through constant amplitude block loading programs or either to random loading with some sort of uh, continuously changing amplitude. 
more or less RAL distribution has been very widely accepted for this type of test. Um, in our case, instead, we wanted to um, we wanted to derive this load history through measurements to um, try not to lose load sequence effects, especially those to related to single axle loading. So uh, we have instrumented this bridge, this Venage bridge is between uh, Geneva and, and Lausanne, and we are monitoring one section through, uh, through strain gauge measurements. The results that we show you here are only related to, to the strain gauge C1. These are weldable strain gauges. Uh, it's a bit unusual to have B and Z, but before the experimental program was larger, so we just kept the notation C and B. Uh, there were also other two locations that now are dismissed. It's a full bridge configuration, thermally compensated, so we uh, basically don't take into account uh, homogeneous thermal, uh, so basically thermal strains, but we do uh, consider, we do measure those strains. This is a composite bridge, so those strains that come out for, um, due to uh, inhomogeneous thermal expansion, and this can occur in the horizontal plane and in the vertical plane, because can you just imagine when the sun shines, it doesn't heat also the steel uh, uniformly, uh, the same of course for the concrete. So uh, we have uh, a bit uh, overdone the 300 hertz sampling rate that we are reducing for the new measurements. Uh, you can see here a typical trend of a weekly, weekly measurement history of the strains. You can actually recognize the dates, day and night fluctuations. But um, on the right side, instead you see the typical trend of axle load. Um, in fact, we are not interested in this fluctuation, this uh, trains due to uh, the inhomogeneous thermal uh, uh, expansion of the bridge because these are structure dependent. And actually, even within our structure might be, since this is uh, hyperstatic structure, this, for example, if we had the measure and the location here, this would be lower, this effect. So we uh, have to, uh, let's say, uh, detrain the signal, removing this thermal effect. Uh, and do some signal analysis to be able to reduce and come up with the uh, with the uh, with the reduced um, uh, a reduced spectrum that we decide to uh, implement using the Marco transition matrix. Eventually, at the end, you could superimpose the thermal effect, but we are just interested for now in generate a traffic signal. Uh, so this uh, detrending has been done by piecewise hourly linear detrending of our signal because more or less uh, hour by hour you couldn't see uh, a strong uh, nonlinear behavior of this temperature. And you can see that the detrended signal preserves in fact the shape of the, of, of the original signal. It just shifted around zero. Um, then uh, of course after some denoising to cancel out for example uh, electrical noise uh, uh, we applied a low pass filter at about 2 Hz. We could still uh, get most of the signal by lowering this uh, low pass frequency. We were actually uh, missing some peaks, especially when uh, these peaks were very, were very fastly reached. But we have the problem now that when we want to make a peak to valley reduction, in fact, uh, we, are, we identify many peaks and valleys which are mostly uh, due to still some noise in the signal. These are not really significant stress ranges. Uh, you could see that also if you make a rain flow of this signal, uh, you could see that in fact there is a huge amount of, of, uh, of uh, small strain ranges. Um, this, in this case we show probability, exceedance probability as a function of the strain range. Um, most of the investigations that were done in the literature uh, truncated this signal at 25% of delta sigma max. but. Uh, this works really well in case you start from a synthetic signal, but uh, the moment you, you measure it, this delta sigma max has a strong weekly dependency because uh, weekly, monthly, and yearly dependence. So we, um, instead of doing that on the basis of sigma max, we have done it on the basis of the strain range related to a 0.2% uh, probability of an exceedance, 0.25% probability of exceedance which is less scattered and, uh, and uh, therefore by cutting off the, the, st the, the stress ranges that were at 25% of this uh, smaller value than the maximum, uh, we were in fact able to, to have uh, a more uh, a cleaner signal without taking into account all, all these small fluctuations. 
it, it could be questionable, 25%, 20%. Although if you consider, uh, let's say, a, an SN curve in the format of the Euro code, if you cut the 25%, for example, um, uh, you have in fact that the accumulated damage below that uh, the, this 25% threshold is, is, will be the damage accumulated by these stress ranges is negligible, less than 1% of the, of the critical damage. Uh, so, uh, following this data reduction, we were able to uh, synthesize the stress, uh, the strain history, uh, you, are, you can really see the traffic, uh, the loads due to the traffic, and to, to further reduce it uh, into, uh, into cycle counting method, we use the Markov transition matrix. Uh, with this uh, Markov transition, the reason of using this is to avoid making assumptions related to uh, minimum stress that you have applied or minimum load or load ratio um, that, that, that you need to make when you sample from, from the rain flow because the rain flow doesn't give you, if you resample, doesn't give you a continuous signal which instead uh, by using this method is what you obtain. So by a combination of weekly transition matrices, we come up with, uh, we call it representative uh, uh, Marco transition matrix that it can be used to resemble the original signal. I mean, not really the original signal, a synthetic signal, but that uh, somehow preserves uh, those features that were belonging to the original signal that you saw. This you will show the strain as a function of the peak to valley, valley to peak transition. So uh, the idea here, and we will start uh, as far as the, uh, as far as we have a couple of more uh, uh, constant amplitude uh, failures under constant amplitude loading, is to apply a representative, uh, this representative sample block of loading up repeatedly up to failure in such a way that we can uh, experimentally retrieve a Gastner curve for uh, for this uh, specific uh, uh, spectrum that is intended to be specific for, for bridge structures, of course. So as a conclusion, we have done this preliminary constant amplitude fatigue test. Uh, we have uh, uh, experimentally uh, obtained this constant amplitude fatigue test for this transverse attachment made of S690 QL structural steel. Uh, we have uh, uh, identified the procedure for uh, determining a representative Markov transition matrix uh, uh, for the, for at least for the Venage bridge uh, and uh, uh, sampling these uh, stress histories in order to perform random block loading variable amplitude fatigue test. Uh, as a future step, we will evaluate the use of uh, the uh, ACPD over DIC, perform variable amplitude fatigue character rate test using, using sorry, the same load history to, to, uh, in order to um, experimentally calculate uh, uh, average fatigue character rate due to the spectrum and calibrate fatigue life prediction model for evaluating critical damage as baseline for reliability analysis. Thank you.